75 years ago, on August 6, 1945, the United States dropped a nuclear bomb on Hiroshima. Although the Americans emphasized the unprecedented power of their new weapon, addressing the world and especially Japan, they completely denied that it was radioactive. Before you watch this video, I'm going to ask you to support my channel with a thumbs up. It won't cost you anything, but it means a lot to me and my channel. Thank you. There is no residual radiation after the explosion, the city is completely safe for humans, and the Japanese reports of atomic poisoning are propaganda. How and why have the US authorities by all means, from military censorship to articles by scientists in the media, for many years concealed, denied and downplayed the facts of radioactive contamination and radiation sickness? This article was first published in 2015, on the 70th anniversary of the bombing. Any information about the effects of the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki was immediately declared a military secret, but the three main results, explosions, fires and radiation, were treated very differently. The strength of the explosion was glorified by the Americans in every way possible. In the first official report on Hiroshima, President Truman declared that a single bomb, more powerful than 20,000 tons of dynamite, had been dropped on the Japanese city. The press focused on the physical destruction, between August 7 and 31, the New York Times devoted 16 articles to it. Damage from fires attracted far less attention, not because of censorship restrictions, but because after the bombing of Dresden and Hamburg such consequences had become commonplace. The Americans blocked information about radiation contamination on all fronts, they seized reports from Japanese doctors, censored the press, intimidated independent scientists, and misled the public bans, threats, and soothing propaganda. Once Japanese doctors and scientists reached Hiroshima, they noticed strange symptoms in bomb survivors. Gamma radiation was indicated by blackened photographic paper and x-ray film. However, the head physician at Hiroshima Hospital, Michihiko Hachiya, did not understand what his patients were dying of. Hachiya suspected that a chemical or bacteriological bomb had been dropped on the city. By the end of August, autopsy reports showed damage to all the organs that make up blood cells, and Heisha spoke of radiation sickness for the first time. The terminology was not yet settled, the Japanese referred to the ailment as atomic bomb sickness, x-ray disease, atomic poisoning, and atomic plague. The US administration confiscated all Japanese doctors' reports, case histories, photographs, and biopsy data. Most of the material was sent to the U.S. and partly translated into English. Since the Japanese collected their data only a few days after the explosions, they became an invaluable source of information for American doctors and chemical and radiological weapons experts, of course, those who had security clearance. All Japanese materials were sent to the Military Institute of Pathology where they were classified as top secret for many years. In America itself, the military could not afford such censorship. Immediately after the strike on Nagasaki, a Washington geneticist, Harold Jacobson, caused a sensation in the media. All who enter Hiroshima are doomed to death, the monstrous force of the explosion makes radioactive all the substance around. The rains over Hiroshima will collect the deadly rays and carry them to the rivers and seas, threatening all life. The newspapers cited the scientists' words, but tried to reassure the public. The New York Times immediately issued a rebuttal, Army Rejects Dr. Jacobson's Theories. Robert Oppenheimer, the scientific director of the Manhattan Project, wrote, There is every reason to believe that there is no radioactive radiation on Hiroshima. All radioactive elements decayed instantly. The FBI and Army intelligence agents came to Jacobson's home, and after hours of interrogation the scientist recanted his statements to the press. In the two days between the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the New York Times had 132 news articles about those events, but not a word about radiation. There were about 15 articles on radioactivity in 1945 to 1946, nine of which downplayed its severity. Six of the contributions, however, showed wariness. Until the physicists who gave us the bomb and the doctors make clear statements, we can only hope that Tokyo has exaggerated the effects of radiation in order to gain the sympathy of the world public, August 25, 1945 article. 
But the paper's generally optimistic view of the new weapons was due in no small part to the persona of the New York Times science correspondent, William L. Lawrence. He was the only journalist allowed into the Los Alamos laboratory, observing the first nuclear weapons test, Trinity, and the bombing of Nagasaki, he was taken to fly in the corrective action plane. Lawrence's articles either ignored or denied the fact of radioactive radiation after a nuclear explosion. Here is the headline of the first piece he wrote in Japan, September 12, 1945, No Radiation on the Ruins of Hiroshima. It is not known whether Lawrence knew he was misleading readers or whether he simply trusted his sources in the U.S. Army. The truth comes out. But how are Americans still able to learn the truth about the penetrating radiation and radioactive contamination of the area? Largely due to the conflicting interests of various government agencies. As many as four teams were sent to Japan to study the biomedical effects of the bombing, from the Manhattan Engineering District, the U.S. Navy, the Strategic Bombing Survey Board, USSBS, and a Joint Commission of the Army, Navy and Nuclear Scientists. The report of the Joint Commission was safely concealed under a seal of secrecy. Its first part, external damage to Hiroshima, notes, the high health hazards posed by various kinds of radiation are discussed in the medical part of this report. However, neither in the file nor in the corresponding collection of the National Archives was it possible to find this part. By the way, many other medical documents in this fund were declassified twice, in 1961 and in the 1990s. Probably, in the middle of the century they decided to close them from the general public again, however, the repeated declassification could be related to a more thorough check of the documents. On June 7, 1946, a voluminous and richly detailed report was presented by the USSBS staff. The multiplicity of the expert group, 110 people, and the anonymity of the text must have given the authors courage. It was frankly admitted that the deadly consequences of the explosion and the insidious threat of gamma rays speak for themselves. The report detailed the stages of radiation sickness, the risk of infertility and miscarriages among victims of the bombing. Even timely medical treatment would prevent at most 5 to 8 percent of deaths. The report was openly critical of the medical director of the Manhattan Project, Stafford Warren, who had assured the Senate Atomic Energy Commission that radiation exposure was responsible for 7 to 8 percent of deaths in the two Japanese cities. In fact, the figure was as high as 15 to 20 percent, the USSBS experts pointed out. Ten days later, the Manhattanites released their report. It was inspired by General Leslie Groves, and his subordinates struggled to refute the USSBS findings. Radiation sickness was not mentioned at all as a cause of human casualties at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Bombing victims died from burns at the time of the explosion, fires, mechanical injuries, collapsed buildings, and last but not least, from ionizing effects in the first minute after the explosion. The authors of the report emphasized that the induced radioactivity from the fission products of the nucleus did not cause disease or death. The most frank was the Navy report. It came out quite early, December 1945. Its authors cooperated with Japanese doctors and scientists and performed autopsies on 14 victims of radioactive radiation. Only the Navy indicated deaths from secondary radiation induced radioactivity in the urban environment. Most likely the reason is that the Navy, in contrast to the Army, was not responsible for the development and use of atomic bombs and could afford an objective assessment of the consequences. The authors of the report recommended that its contents be made public immediately, but despite this request, the text was not declassified until 1976. Reasons for the secrecy But why was information about radioactive contamination hushed up and denied in the United States? After all, as early as 1945, it became clear to the military and scientists that radiation was killing tens of thousands of people in Japan. Why was it necessary to gloss over the obvious? First, U.S. authorities wanted to make sure that soldiers who landed in Japan were not endangering their health. A high-ranking army official specifically instructed Donald Collins, a Manhattan Project engineer, a dosimetry specialist, your job is to prove that there is no radiation left after the bomb. And later, even though a typhoon never allowed Collins' group to reach Nagasaki, the scientists were surprised to read the finished conclusions of their study in Stars and Stripes, 
the official newspaper of the U.S. Department of Defense. Second, the Manhattan Project staff paid remarkably little attention to ionizing radiation after the first tests of the atomic thing at the New Mexico test site, May July 1945. In memos from that period, some scientists warned that there would be a burst of radioactive radiation in the first seconds after the explosion, but their concern was solely for the safety of the bomber crew. According to historians, due to the high level of secrecy and the fragmented nature of parts of the work on the bomb, scientists rarely shared information even with each other, let alone with the public. But the main reason for the military's refusal to acknowledge radioactive contamination lies elsewhere. The army and civilians who created the atomic weapon and authorized its use against Japanese cities wanted the bomb to be perceived as an ordinary weapon used in a just war, just more powerful. And when reports appeared in the Japanese and European media about poisonous gas flowing across the ground, soaked with radiation from the fissile atoms of uranium, the US was quick to call it propaganda. However, alarm was raised in official circles, none of the authors of the Manhattan Project wanted his name associated with chemical and biological weapons, and the United States was the first country to use chemical munitions in World War II. Curiously, these weapons were condemned not only by the public, but also by the military, although Congress did not sign the 1925 Geneva Protocol, the US unofficially adopted a doctrine of no first use of chemical and biological weapons. Even at the height of anti-Japanese hysteria in the 1940s, proponents of these means, proving their usefulness and acceptability, morally, met stubborn opposition in the White House, including from President Roosevelt. The denial, concealment and manipulation of data on penetrating radiation and radioactive contamination after the nuclear explosions in Hiroshima and Nagasaki initiated a special culture of secrecy that became established not only in the United States and the USSR, but also in other states dealing with nuclear weapons and nuclear power. The withholding of information about radiation in the Alamogordo Desert, Hiroshima and Nagasaki was followed by complete silence about the consequences of the Nevada test site and the numerous radiation accidents at U.S. industrial complexes. The Japanese government's inarticulate response to the Fukushima I accident and the cover-up of the seriousness of what happened shows that silence and cover-up are still occurring in the 21st century. I thank you for watching. Your support is very important to me. Your comments and thumbs up motivate me to release new videos on interesting topics. Subscribe and turn on notifications. See you in the new videos.